Good morning. Steve here again. Uh, today I'd like to tell you about the bat woman and how this virus got to the lab in Wuhan. Now in 2002 there was a SARS epidemic. Quite a killer and uh, there was a lot of concern with it so they tried to track that down. And there was a doctor in uh, China, a woman, Dr. Xi, S-H-I, who uh, went around to all over the country to bat caves and just uh, collected samples of viruses and brought them back to her lab in Wuhan. And uh, there were maybe thousands of these samples that were brought back there. So, but it takes her a long time. So she starts searching in 2002, 2003, doesn't really find all this till 2013, so it's a long, long process to find that. But in between times, um, people are concerned, time passes, and in 2010 there is another p potential pandemic uh, virus called the uh, uh, H5N5H1, uh, the H5N1, I'm sorry, which is the avian flu very very deadly but as we've said before it was limited to chickens and you had to touch the chickens to get it so they destroyed the chickens saved it but there was a professor in Holland a Ron Foshier F-O-C-H-I-E-R who was concerned about these types of viruses and how many steps were necessary in order for it to get to the human transmission again so he developed a, uh, and the process for determining that in the lab is growing cell cultures and whatever, very complicated, you know, stitching it together. But he discovered a fast, easy, cheap way of doing it, which we know as animal passage. Now, what Dr. Ron did is he took some ferrets. Ferrets' immune system very much like our immune system. So what happens in the ferret kind of can be predicted to be what would happen in people. So he takes the first ferret and he gives it the virus and sets it aside and waits for it to get sick. And when it does get sick, Dr. Ron goes in and pulls the virus out and then grabs a new healthy ferret. Oh no, Dr. Ron, don't give me that needle. Oh, he got me. And so injects him. He gets sick. We take the virus out of him, and we put it in the third one, and the fourth one, and the fifth one. Six, seven, eight, nine, ten, and finally he's got the tenth one there. More ferrets lined up to continue the test. This one gets sick, and then before he transfers the virus, this one next door gets sick. And so Dr. Ron knows right then that that is where the point of mutation has occurred enough. Each time you pass it to a new ferret, it mutates, that it is finally mutated to the point where it is contagious, ferret to ferret, and thusly person to person. So, as we said in the past, this creates an uproar in the scientific community. This is dangerous to do. You're making something that could turn into a monster. And so this is outlawed by President Obama in 2011. So nobody can do this. So time passes. And in 2013, Dr. Xi, the bat woman, discovers where the SARS virus came from. And she is very pleased, it's a breakthrough, you know, they applaud this, you know, and it's a great PR thing for the Chinese government, and they, they love this. So, uh, and she studies all of those, and she finds two viruses that are awfully close to the SARS virus, very, very close to the SARS virus. And so she wants to find out, again, you know, how close are these, you know, how will we find out and the way they find out with this is in order to find out how bad the monster will be they have to take something that is not a monster and then they have to make the monster and then they have to look at the monster to see if the monster is going to kill us so that's the reason they do this stuff and with the 2011 prohibition on doing the ferret passage which is so easy to do they wanted to stop creating these monsters so Dr. Xi 
contacts the University of North Carolina. And they do a paper together. They do a study on how to take one of these viruses she found and turn it into a monster. And so they start work. And it's Dr. Xi, there's a Dr. G, G E from uh, Wuhan. And then at the university, there's a whole list of people from different places that do this. But uh, Ralph Barrick is the person at the University of, Wisconsin, of, uh, West, of North Carolina. So they do this study, and then they write a paper. This is the paper. I downloaded it off the internet. And it tells you it's 2015. It tells you who did this, exactly what they did. And they found out some various things in here. They found out that these viruses, you know, the coronavirus has these spikes. Those spikes are what cause it to be Velcro for your neck and your lungs. That's what gets it in there and allows it to penetrate your lungs, those spikes. So spikes very important. So they found that there were five of these spike residues that had to line up to make it able to get the human lungs. And so they went about maximizing the potential for this. They used their normal routes, which were the uh, uh, petri dishes and whatever, and they succeeded. They made, together the data confirmed the ability of these viruses to infect human airway cells and underscore the potential threat of cross-species transmission. So they did it, they made this thing. Well, then they find out that uh, they tested against the SARS antibodies. SARS antibodies are no help. It's immune to that. And in the end, they say this. Together, the results establish the viability of full-length virus, but suggest that further ad adaptation is required for its replication to be equivalent to that of SARS. So they're saying that they've got it almost, but they need a little further development in order to get it to be exactly what they have. They also say in here that the bat populations that they find out in the country says both theories imply that pools of bat coronaviruses are limited and that host range mutations are both random and rare, reducing the likelihood of future emergence of these events in humans. So they're saying that the likelihood of this is random and rare. Um, and then lastly, they say here on this page, is on the basis of these findings, scientific review, review panels may deem similar studies building these mutated viruses based on circulating strains too risky to pursue, as increased pathogenicity in mammalian models cannot be excluded. So they run this paper and they find out they better be careful. So Dr. Xi takes this virus back home. Uh, to the lab. And in 2017, several things happened. One, their new lab the French built, added onto this, passes the BSL-4 level. This is the highest level of safety. Also, this allows them to do animal passage, which qualifies them to do it. Plus, the restrictions on animal passage are off in 2017. Plus, the Chinese military takes over control of the lab in 2017. Now, maybe they sat there and did nothing with that, but maybe they wanted to see if they could make that into a little bigger monster. All they need is a few ferrets. They could probably go to the wet market and buy a bunch of those for a buck fifty. So those are all the pieces that are on the board. Those are everything that we have these pieces in place. We'll never know the truth. They've destroyed the evidence. We'll never know the truth. But what I'm doing here is lining up that the potential for these things to occur is very real. It's in black and white. It is documented. And those viruses are in that lab in 2017. And in 2019, something evil comes out of that lab. And that's what we're dealing with. And tomorrow, next video, we're going to talk about how that virus escaped from the lab because now we know how it got in there. It doesn't have to be that specific virus. There's 1,500 different ones. But the knowledge existed to do those things to create those monsters. So we'll talk again. Thanks.